go down. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, MINOVA lecture series. So this is the first MINOVA after this pandemic. I think one last one in person just two years ago. This is also the 10 years after the first Minova lecture given by J.B. Sayer in 2004. So we are very uh, grateful to Minova Foundation to establish this uh, uh, lecture series. Today we are um, well, um, very fortunate to have Bhagav Bhatt to give this uh, uh, series of lecture. Um, may probably many of them you know already know Baga. Uh, he was an um, undergraduate from Columbia, where uh, American State. Then he received a PhD from Princeton, as the advisor of field in Columbia. And then uh, he became a postdoc, I guess, from IH in Michigan. But now he's a professor at the Michigan. And uh, I guess the last year, you will see his new horizon in mathematics. Also, um, his play uses the field. And I guess in, a, in the fall, he will move to Princeton in IH. Let's welcome uh, Bob. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks a lot for this invitation. It's a great honor uh, and a pleasure to be back in Princeton. I look forward to my time here. Um, right, so in these lectures, I want to talk about uh, prismatic cohomology. Um, so, prismatic cohomology is a recently discovered cohomology theory in algebraic geometry. Uh, it was somehow designed to study torsion phenomena in the cohomology of algebraic variety. And it's, it's been kind of helpful in that regard. So, there were two historic, historically, there were two motivations for uh, trying to find this cohomology theory. One of those came from number theory, so the desire to better understand uh, Galois representations in the HL cohomology of algebraic varieties. Uh, and the other one came from homotopy theory, um, namely there were some calculations by Lars Hesselholt that strongly suggested that something like prismatic cohomology ought to exist. And so what I want to do in this first lecture is just go over a little bit of this history and this origin story uh, of where prismatic cohomology came from, a very tiny amount about what the shape of the answer looked like, and then what are some things it's useful for? Um, so that was the plan of the talk. Uh, I wanna emphasize that if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me uh, and ask at any point. I'm very happy to uh, answer. Okay, so let me, let me begin with the first motivation. Uh, so. I want to begin in complex geometry, um, namely in classical Hodge theory. So let me fix a, a prime number P. Actually, I guess P is fixed for the entire lecture series. Um, it can very well be two if you want. Um, if you can say some interesting things in that case. But. Can you guys hear that better? Okay, so let, recall that there is a classical uh, theorem, I guess, due to Hodge um, and also Duran. Uh, I guess it's from the 1930s. Um, and it's a description of the singular cohomology of a, 
of a certain class of complex manifolds in terms of their geometry. So uh, let's say X is a compact uh, scalar manifold, complex manifold. So the example of most relevance to us is the case of algebraic varieties. So you might think that X is embedded inside CPN as a submanifold. And this course is a tree algebraic. Um, so in this context, uh, Hodge theory uh, gives a description of the singular homology of X in terms that have to do with the geometry of X. So one version of the statement is the following. That if you look at the singular cohomology with complex coefficients, it is canonically isomorphic. Uh, well, maybe I should say it in two parts. So first of all, it's canonically isomorphic to the ROM cohomology with complex coefficients. Uh, so what I mean is uh, the notion of cohomology that you get if you use the holomorphic differential forms everywhere. But further, it decomposes into a direct sum over i plus j equals n of subspaces h i j. Um, and these subspaces are essentially uh, those Durham cohomology classes, which in local coordinates, you can represent as a wedge of i many dz's and j many dz bars. Possibly, I have it split, I'm sorry. Um, but so it's something that, I, that definitely has a lot to do with the complex structure uh, on x. And the left-hand side does not. The left-hand side is a purely topological invariant. If you sort of vary the complex structure on X in a family, uh, the left-hand side doesn't change. And so this gives some connection between the topology of X and the geometry of X. And you can use it in both directions. Um, you can sort of feed information from the topology into the geometry and vice versa. So for example, um, let's say you assumed that X was simply connected, uh, so a topological assumption on, on the space X. That implies that H1 with complex coefficients vanishes. The simple connectedness implies in particular that the first homology vanishes. And so if you move it over here, it tells you that the subspaces H01 and H10 both have to vanish. Uh, one of those subspaces, H, I guess, 10, uh, is exactly uh, the space of globally defined holomorphic one forms on X. It's, uh, so there's no anti-holomorphic component if J is zero. And so what this theorem says is that if you have a simply connected uh, manifold like so, then it has no non-zero global holomorphic one form. So you get some geometric consequence out of this topological assumption. And you can also sort of go backwards. Um, add, maybe I'll say, just say one example. So uh, there's an obvious symmetry on this side. Uh, Hij and Hji, those vector spaces are isomorphic because complex conjugation swaps the two. And so what this means is that if you look at the, those cohomology groups where n is odd, um, then the sort of sums, some ends that show up over here, they occur in pairs uh, of the same size. And so the dimension of the right-hand side will, as a result, be even, because it will be a sum of two finitely many times. And so therefore, that tells you that this dimension is also even. And so you learn that the odd uh, dimensional singular cohomology groups uh, have even dimension in this case. And so you can use that to rule out, for example, the presence of a scalar structure on various manifolds. Um, okay, so this is what I wanted to recall uh, about classical Hodge theory. And what I wanna go, what I wanna address in the rest of these talks is essentially a defect of this isomorphism. Uh, namely, that in this isomorphism, you're working with complex coefficients. And so you've completely forgotten all the torsion information in the cohomology of X. If the cohomology of X had like a two torsion class, that completely dies, you cannot see it with complex coefficients. And so the basic question uh, that motivated uh, what I'm gonna talk about is the following. So how to understand, well, what I wanna say is torsion classes geometrically, but if you know a little bit about how the universal coefficient theorem works in algebraic topology, understanding torsion is more or less the same as understanding cohomology with mod p coefficients. If you understand p torsion, you understand cohomology with mod p coefficients and essentially it's reversible. So I can reformulate this question as saying how to understand the cohomology of x 
the coefficients in this finite field f t with, with t elements uh, geometrically. And so obviously, I mean, this, this kind of description is not going to work because Gram cohomology is going to produce a perfect zero vector space that's to, to with functions on x. Um, and the answer I would like to convince you of by, or a partial answer anyways, um, that I would like to convince you of by the end of the talks is you can essentially, well, there's something very similar, uh, except the Durham side has to be interpreted correctly. And so what you need to do is the answer somehow lies in the mod t geometry of x rather than in x itself. And so here's the answer that I'll try to flesh out as time goes on. So this is answer only in the algebraic case. So for x smooth projective, so like so, uh, in the mod t geometry of x. So we will be able to see such a cohomology class as a differential form somewhere, but that somewhere is not gonna be the original x, but rather something related to x but that lives over ft. Okay, uh, are there any questions so far? As I said, please feel free to ask at any point. Okay, so let's let's not try and make more sense of this kind of nonsensical statement. Um, so I want to talk about mod t hot theory. Um, and so if you want to talk about this, um, you you need to be in a setup where reduction mod t makes sense. Uh, essentially, what I want to do in order to make sense of this phrase over here is I want to take the defining equations of x and just reduce the coefficients modulo t to get some equations in characteristic t and that's gonna be my geometric object in characteristic t that I'm gonna, uh, it's gonna play the role of the right hand side. And so in order to do that, your equations need to be drawn from a ring where reduction mod t makes sense. They can't just be complex numbers. Like it doesn't make sense to reduce pi modulo t, uh, but it does make sense to reduce five modulo t. And so let's, uh, let me just recall what that setup is. So there's a standard way of doing this is through the p-adic numbers. And so let's just introduce those objects. So zp is the ring of p-adic integers. Uh, if you squint a little bit, uh, this is more or less the same as z-localized p uh, for all intents and purposes as far as these lectures are concerned. So it's, it's a pretty familiar object. Um, formally is defined as uh, you take the integers and you cook up a metric on it, which has to do with the prime t. And basically the metric is measuring how divisible the number is basically. So t squared is gonna be smaller than t. Uh, and then zp is the completion with respect to that metric. Uh, the sort of salient features are uh, zp connects characteristic zero and characteristic t. So if you, if you kill t, you get the finite field ft. And if you invert t, you get a field of characteristic zero, which is called the field of p-adic numbers. Um, and then since we wanna do geometry and not arithmetic, at least initially, uh, we wanna go up to the algebraic closure. So, go up to QP bar uh, and um, somehow it's easier to work with objects which are complete rather than objects which are not complete. So ZP was defined to be complete so QP is more or less complete by definition, but this guy is not complete by definition because it's some infinite degree extension of something which is complete. So it's kind of like asking if an infinite direct sum of copies of the real numbers is a complete vector space. And it's not, and so you complete it. And uh, this is called CT, uh, the p-adic complex numbers. And I will just abbreviate this as C in this talk. Um, this is not a super abusive notation because this field is abstractly isomorphic to the complex numbers, uh, the usual complex numbers. Okay, so in particular, if you have a variety 
This is the same thing as the usual complex objective variety. You can uh, make ask the same questions you would ask have asked on on this side. And so X is going to be my geometric object, and it lives over ZP, and it's smooth and subjective. Um, and so roughly, what this means uh, is your equations uh, have coefficients in in the string of theatic integers, and they have sort of good behavior. So the smoothness is a niceness condition. And so the picture. Uh, for people that don't think about this, is something like the following. So here's your x. Uh, ZP you're supposed to think of as a little curve. So I'll put spec ZP here. Spec is the process of passing from rings to spaces in algebraic geometry. Uh, there are two points on the space, so it's not really a curve in a reasonable sense, but okay. Uh, there's a point corresponding to going mod P. And there's a point corresponding to inverting P, um, doing this operation. And over each of those points, you have a fiber, which is a variety in the usual sense. So here's X, Fp, and here's Xc. And the assumption that X is smooth and projective ensure that both of these are nice objects, so they're smooth projective varieties over the corresponding field. And so this is kind of like a vibration in topology, the, the smooth submersion all fibers are sort of essentially the same, except there's arithmetic complications related to the fact that the base is not a usual curve. Okay, and so let me just write this. So cast to X, you get these two varieties. And the more precise version of this answer uh, that I'm going to formulate now is the statement that if you're interested in uh, understanding the P portion in the cohomology of this variety, in the, which is a variety over the usual complex numbers, you need to understand the Durand cohomology of this variety. Okay, uh, let me, yeah, I guess I can formulate it over here. So I'll just state a theorem um, which summarizes what the precise dictionary is to go from uh, one to the other. It's slightly loosely formulated, but I hope that's okay. Uh, so this was a few years ago now, I guess. Uh, the discovery, uh, I guess I'm too old now, I've forgotten when it actually happened. I think it was 2014, that could be. Um, Okay, anyway, so the, what the theorem is gonna say is that uh, there's gonna be a relation between uh, these two cohomologies and the way the relation is realized is not by saying that two spaces are isomorphic because it turns out that they're not actually isomorphic. But there's a family of cohomology theories that interpolates between them. Um, so to make sense of the family, you need one extra dimension. And so let me call that uh, ring A, so it's the ring of formal uh, power series over the field FP. And then the theorem is that there exists a cohomology theory, which is a version of prismatic cohomology, attached to X, uh, which takes values in finitely generated A modules. Uh, and it satisfies the following two properties. So this, this cohomology theory is supposed to interpolate between the singular cohomology here and the Durham cohomology here. And so here's one way to say it. Uh, so if you take this module, which lives over this ring A, which has this parameter U in it, and you invert U, what you get is just the usual singular cohomology. With mod P coefficients, uh, scalar extended to the correct ring. So, I mean, this is an FP vector space. This is a Laurent series module, so throw that in. Yeah. 
I guess I could just try this. Is it a join one of them? So it's essentially just a usual singular cohomology with mod two coefficients. Uh, but then something funny happens if you go modular u. So if you go modular u, it no longer looks like singular cohomology. Rather, it looks like Durand cohomology. So uh, if you reduce modular u, uh, if you do it at the level of cohomology groups, you just get an injection uh, to the Durand cohomology of this variety in terms of key. And if you sort of did everything in some sufficiently derived uh, uh, context, uh, you would actually get an isomorphism over here. But anyways, this is a precise statement just at the level of a billion groups. Um, and so this has an immediate consequence, which is uh, the following. So, yeah, the consequence is the following inequality. So essentially the, the consequence says that the dimension of singular cohomology is bounded above by the dimension of Durand cohomology. Uh, it's an inequality because I don't so this modules uh, that are showing up, uh, if they were U torsion free, so this ring over here is a PID. So by the classification of modules over PID, you know exactly what these modules are gonna look like. There's gonna be a bunch of free parts and then a bunch of torsion parts. If there were no torsion parts, then both those periods would have the same size. And so the inequality would actually be an equality. But in the presence of torsion, U torsion in these groups, uh, you don't get an equality. Uh, you get more stuff when you go modulo u, and so this side can be bigger. And that does happen in examples. So this is essentially the best you can do. You cannot hope to get an equality. There are examples already with surfaces where uh, you see this phenomenon. Um, right. And so this is the mechanism I was alluding to uh, for transferring information from the mod T cohomology of complex varieties, which is uh, on the left over here to something involving differential forms, uh, which is on the right over here. So formally, one thing you could do is you could take a cohomology class over here. Uh, it has some denominators in it. You multiply out by the denominators to get an element of this module without converting anything. And then you reduce those elements modular u to get a Durham cohomology class. So it's a process to go from uh, the topological side to the geometric side. Uh, and it can be quite useful. Um, so what I wanted to do next is mention some uh, sample applications of this, uh, this package. Uh, what are the kinds of things you could uh, try to do with it? But maybe I should pause for a second and see if there are any questions so far. Moving on Zoom. Uh, sorry, was the inequality known without the prismatic ring? No, no. Um, so there was previous work by uh, Faltings and Caruso, which gives uh, such an inequality as an actual equality under more assumptions. So essentially you need assumptions of the form that the dimension has to be small compared to P. And also, uh, I guess I didn't say this, but the, I restricted the un, to the unramified case in the lecture, but I mean, the theory makes sense over any ramified base. And in those classical theorems, you also have to assume that the ramification is small. Uh, and then you actually get an equality. And in general, uh, I think the simplest example where something bad can happen is you can have a surface over F2 where this guy has size four and this guy has size two. Right, so what are some, I guess I have to put here, sample applications. Uh, 
Uh, so I think I'll mention three of them. Um, and th these are all applications by other people. So since this has been around for a few years now, people have figured out how to do things with it. Um, and so the first one is about exactly this process I was talking about, about taking uh, classes on this side and moving them to classes on this side, and then making arguments that you can only make with differential forms, right? So if you have a differential form, you can ask whether or not it's zero locally. That's a sensible question. And usually, like, if the differential form is non-zero, it's not gonna manage locally by analytic continuation. Like a function cannot manage on a complex manifold on an open subset without vanishing on the manifold itself. Um, and so there are arguments you can make on this side that are harder to see on this side, and this can be useful. So here's one application of that. So you may translate, I guess I'm just gonna write what I said, classes. on the left-hand side to differential forms on the right-hand side sometimes, meaning if you get lucky and you actually live in the part of the wrong homology that corresponds to globally defined differential forms. Differential forms on SFT sometimes. Uh, and then make local arguments. So here's uh, one example. So this is in the work of uh, uh, Farb, Benson Farb, uh, Mark Kissin, and uh, Jesse Wolfson. So the question about the, in the topology of complex varieties. Um, Farb. Um, and it's essentially, well, it's a question in algebraic geometry. The question is asking that if you take a abelian variety over the complex numbers, so a complex torus, which is algebraic, you look at the multiplication by P map on this complex torus. This is a very interesting endomorphism that shows up in a lot of different areas of math. And what you, a question you can ask is like, what is the minimal complexity that you need to define this endomorphism? For example, is this endomorphism pulled back from something from a smaller dimensional variety, even by rational weights? And what it proves is that the answer is no, using some of this stuff. So, Here's a precise statement. Abelian variety. Uh, and you need to assume that P is sufficiently large. And I was sort of surprised that even for P is sufficiently large, you actually get an interesting statement out of this. Uh, but you do. So here's what they say. <laughs> Application by P map from A to A, uh, this is the notation. Uh, this is a group, so you can multiply, a billion group, so you can multiply by P. And what they say is that P from A to A is not pulled back even by rationally. from a smaller dimensional base. So, I mean, if you like, it's a statement of the level of function fields and it's saying that this uh, finite extension of function fields uh, really needs uh, the dimension of A many transcendental variables to actually define. Uh, this was a conjecture of Brosnan and I think this theorem is from last year, 2021. So that's a so purely complex algebra geometric statement. Uh, uh, I'm saying that, okay, so forgetting about the parenthetical, what it means is that this map is not the pullback of something, uh, like there's no map from A to a smaller dimensional variety and a finite cover of the smaller dimensional variety which pulls back to this map. So it's, it's genuinely defined over A and not over something smaller. Uh, and then birationally means that the state statement true on open sets. So. Um, right. The second uh, remark is um, this also gives you a criterion for uh, when singular cohomology has no p-torsion. So usually understanding torsion in cohomology is quite hard. Um, like we don't sort of have that many tools to exactly uh, describe it, but this theorem at least gives you a criterion. 
So it gives you the following criterion, the pros and trainers. Uh, you have to do a little bit of work, but it's not too hard. It's linear algebra. So if uh, if the dimension of the Durham cohomology of the complex variety, so it's the usual Durham cohomology, uh, is equal to the dimension of the Durham cohomology of the mod T variety. So on the Durham side, somehow, if nothing changes, when you go from characteristic zero to characteristic T, uh, then in fact, the singular cohomology is torsion free. T torsion free. This is for fixed T, yeah. Fixed P and fixed N, yeah. Um, right. And so this can, uh, this can be useful in concrete situations. Um, so uh, recently, which maybe means I guess 2019, but everything is a blur to me right now for the past few years. Uh, this was used uh, by Colmes, Sostinescu, and Nizio for a calculation. And so what they proved The proof using this idea is that uh, the singular cohomology of a very interesting uh, p adic variety is p torsion free. And so that variety is called the Grinfeld upper half space. plays a rather important role in the p uh, Langlands program. And they proved more than this, but this is just the simplest thing to state. Uh, they essentially use a more elaborate version of, uh, of this kind of argument to completely describe what these cohomology groups are. Uh, there are some natural group groups that are acting on the situation and they really describe it as a representation. Um, and Did you mean the CP coefficients? Ah, oh, sorry, thank you, yes. Otherwise, this is gonna be useless <laughs> or nonsensical. Thank you. Um, right, uh, and then the third thing I wanted to mention was uh, was actually one of some of the directions of the initial motivation. So I said that part of the motivation for this project was to understand uh, these groups better. And I guess I never actually said why. Uh, the reason was simply that if X is defined over something like a number field, then these groups carry a Galois action. And this is sort of a prototypical example for Galois representation of the Galois group of that number field, uh, which is something we definitely want to understand and prove all kinds of things about. And so this gives you a new tool for saying something about Galois representation. And uh, this was used uh, to, uh, let's see, so yeah. This was used in the proof of the K conjecture for K3 surfaces. You may effectively control the Galois action on these singular cohomology groups uh, through this cohomology theory. So you get some kind of finer statements about this action. Uh, and one of the statements that you get uh, was used by uh, Ito Koshikawa, Koshi, sorry, Ito Ito Koshikawa uh, in their proof of the K conjecture for K3 surfaces in characteristic cube. So I won't write it out. Uh, 
essentially like there's a there was a mechanism existing mechanism for proving the Tate conjecture not in KRC2 that relied on certain statements about uh, uh, Shimura varieties and how more precisely Kissin's work relating Galois representations to crystals uh, uh, is compatible with geometry. And uh, using the stuff, you can uh, run the same arguments also in KRC2. It's a very kind of impressionistic summary. Okay. Uh, so these were three of the applications I wanted to mention. Uh, they're all kind of recent. So I think this one is also in the, did I write this down? This was 2018. Um, uh, there are other things I could say, but I wanted to say a little bit uh, now about the topological side, which was another motivation for this. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yes, so the, the, the characteristic zero Betty number is less than or equal to this one. And then this one is less than or equal to this one. And so exactly, you're proving this criterion. You're saying if the outer two are equal, then so is the middle number. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, so this is a little bit about what, roughly what this theory kind of, what the output is and things you can do with it. Now let's try to get a little bit into uh, where it actually comes from. Um, so, I mean, for people, especially graduate students that are now trying to understand what's going on, it might be slightly confusing because there are actually three constructions of this theory that are all different from each other. Um, and they're all kind of useful in their own ways. So I just want to write one word for each of them. Well, I guess I didn't say it. this theory is called prismatic homology. Um, and so there's a, the original one that we uh, first wrote down was an analytic one. Uh, by analytic, I mean p-adic analytic. So this uses perfectly spaces. More precisely, crucially uses uh, the fault things almost purity theorem. Um, and it's, uh, okay, I don't want to say much more about that in this talk. Uh, there's a second one, which is more algebraic, uh, which is through this notion of prisms, uh, which is in fact what my second talk is going to be about. Uh, it sometimes is the most flexible one. Um, it's also the easiest one. If I don't know, if you're going to try to implement this on a computer, I suspect this would be the easiest one to implement. Um, but historically, the first one that we wanted uh, was an entirely different one. So it was a homotopical one. And this is sort of via K theory. And so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is just tell you a little bit about how, how the story goes, uh, what the connection with uh, K theory is. So you're now kind of, it's going to feel like I mean, we're changing direction. Yeah, I'm going to not talk about applications anymore. Um, right. So, okay. Where does, what is K theory? Where does it start? Uh, so it, my impression is that it starts in the work of Grothendieck. Uh, he defined this notion of a K group uh, attached to a ring or even algebraic variety. And it was crucial for both formulating and proving his refinement of the hirzebruck riemann roch theorem. So the grothendieck riemann rock theorem, its formulation depends on the notion of the Grothendieck group, which is uh, also called the K group. Um, so this was in algebra, in algebraic geometry. And uh, Atiyah and Herzberg realized that, first of all, you could say the exact same words in topology. You don't have to work with algebraic vector bundles, you can work with topological vector bundles and uh, uh, do the same thing. And moreover, in topology, if you combine this idea with the bot periodicity theorem, you actually get some much finer structure. So the K group is. Well, 
So let me just kind of recall or summarize what the output of what they do. So it relies on bot. Um, and so, okay, this is gonna be, I guess I should just put this disclaimer now. So there's gonna be a lot of lies in what I'm about to say, because there's a lot of technical complications and I don't wanna get into them, but I'm happy to indulge you if you have questions about them. So for a reasonable, reasonable topological space X, um, you can construct this cohomology theory uh, called complex K theory, which is related to complex factor bundles on X. Uh, and moreover, it's also computable in terms of uh, usual cohomology. So what I want to say is, okay, one has K theory spectrum And please don't worry if you don't know what a spectrum is, just think of it as a chain complex and you won't lose anything uh, for my talk. So it's called K of X, um, parameterizing, properly parameterizing complex vector bundles on X. So that's just the existence part that there exists this cohomology theory um, uh, parameterizing complex vector bundles. And the bot periodicity part gives you a recipe to compute it. So moreover, there exists a filtration on this cohomology theory. So on K of X, such that the graded pieces of the filtration are computed in terms of singular cohomology. So say this way, your I of K of X is the usual singular cohomology of X with integer coefficients, uh, and then you have to shift it by some amount. Um, so you can ignore the declarations. Uh, what, is, what this is saying is a very fancy way of uh, capturing what's called the Atiyah. <laughs> One way of saying it in two lines just saves me some time. Okay, so my impression is that this was the state of affairs in maybe uh, early six, so this was 61, uh, where this spectrum was defined and then you had this theory and then on the topological side, there were a ton of applications of uh, complex K theory to questions of interest in uh, topology. Uh, but back in algebra, which is where uh, K theory was born, uh, we still only had K zero. Uh, there was a Grundy group, but there was no sort of definition of what a higher K group might be. And so there was like an industry of people that were working on this. Uh, the definitive uh, sort of construction was given by Quillen in the early 70s. And so in 73, uh, Quillen wrote down uh, an analog of the first part of, of this theorem. So for any ring R, one has a natural spectrum K of R. So I'll just say it again very vaguely, parameterizing uh, vector bundles on R. So I guess I'm switching between rings and varieties over here. So the translation from rings to varieties translates the notion of a vector bundle on the geometric side to a projective, a finite projective module on the ring side. So parameterizing uh, finitely generated projective R modules. Okay, so again, I'm not giving you any precise definition. There's a construction that takes as input the notion of a finite projective module over a ring and outputs a spectrum, which is uh, what Quillen did. 
Um, and the reason this is more complicated than what Atia and Christopher do is that there is no analog of bot periodicity in this setting. Uh, so these, these groups are not too periodic, which makes them much, much harder to work with, but they're also extremely important. Uh, it's known by now that like torsion and the K groups and the higher K groups is related to uh, invariance of interest in, in arithmetic. Um, and so basically uh, the story for, for the purposes of this talk, the connection is simply that you want an analog of part two of this theorem. You want some statement that says that K theory has a filtration, algebraic K theory, Solent's algebraic K theory has a filtration whose graded pieces are computable in terms of something. Um, uh, something that's relatively easier to understand. And uh, this is, turns out to be essentially prismatic homology. And so I'll just formulate theorem over here. So this is the same set of authors as before, but also it relies on work of uh, Foss and Matthew Morrow. And a whole lot of other people. Um, and uh, the theorem says, uh, right here. so there exists a natural filtration on the case theory of R, but this theorem only describes what happens, what's happening p adequately. So with mod p coefficients or with p to the n coefficients. So let me just, an FP over here to indicate that it's with mod P coefficients. So there's a natural filtration on K of R comma FP and uh, with GER I, so the graded pieces are given by something that's, so it's not literally prismatic homology, uh, but it's something built from prismatic homology. So let me say a little bit about this. So this is over here, it's called symptomic homology. Sorry for throwing a bunch of names at you, but I wanted to write down something precise. It is defined using prismatic homology. So essentially, uh, you have to observe that prismatic homology is not just a module. It has some additional structures and you can use those additional structures to extract simpler invariants out of it. The additional structures being something like a filtration and a Frobenius operator. And so you build this theory on the, from the prismatic side and then uh, you get this kind of a theorem. And so very, so from some bird's eye point of view, what this is saying is the relation of singular homology to complex K theory is similar to the relation of either symptomic or prismatic homology with algebraic K theory, with the caveat that it's only applying after P adic completion to the prime P. Uh, and there's also this et al thing uh, over here, which I will not explain unless someone asks me about it. Um, so this was, okay, so as I said, probably I'm repeating myself now. Uh, Originally, this was our motivation for trying to construct prismatic homology. So there were calculations by Hesselholt that strongly suggested that there should be some natural filtration on the K-theory side whose graded pieces will be related to a really nice homology theory. And so we're trying to find it. Uh, and the theorem says that you can do this. Um, and so I wanted to mention two applications of this, uh, of this theorem, um, one to algebra and one to topology. Are there any questions so far? Yes, actually maybe one thing I should say is uh, the key input in, so th there's a small industry uh, connecting uh, sort of invariance and p adic Hosh theory, like, like these guys over here with invariance and K theory. Uh, nowadays, and it relies uh, crucially on the following uh, calculation by Hasselhoff, or by Boxstedt. So, theorem. 
a calculation of certain homotopy groups. Um, so there's some invariant called topological Hochschild homology. And uh, the homotopy groups of this uh, form a ring. And this ring was computed by Hochstedt to be just a polynomial ring on a degree two class. So. And so this is in some sense the only sort of homotopy theoretic input that's needed in uh, constructing prismatic homology this way. But it's a really hard homotopy theoretic input. Like I, I don't know any, calc any proof of this calculation that doesn't use essentially the full knowledge of the steam rod algebra. Um, so it's using some genuine algebraic topology and I think it will be very interesting to try and understand it better. Um, okay, so let me now mention these two applications. Um, so you can, you can read this in two ways. Um, so first, let me uh, read it in the direction from that you can take some, some knowledge you get on the topological side and translate it to something non-trivial on the algebraic side. So the fact that GUR1 is related to something called FT of 1 is very useful because it turns out that this GUR1 also has an alternative description in terms of uh, something purely geometric that we understand better. So GUR1 of the theorem Uh, it implies the following. <laughs> ring R, so for example, the ring could be just a peach torsion ring. Um, there exists a recipe to calculate Uh, it's Picard group, so the group of line bundles or invertible ideals in R, more precisely, it's the attic completion via uh, the prismatic homology law. So what I'm really saying is that GUR1 on the K-theory side is just the p attic completion of the Picard group. And so the fact that you have that isomorphism tells you that there's a way to compute the p attic completion of the Picard group in terms of prismatic homology. And this is actually useful because um, this is in some sense a nonlinear object, whereas this is much linear. It's much more closely connected to just the algebra, like the equations that define R. Um, it's, if you like, it's some kind of a poor person's uh, version. In terms of homology. Um, and this was used. Um, So what I'm trying to say is um, uh, the, whatever the conjectures of purity conjectures of Gabber were, they were easy to prove on the prismatic side because they were essentially true by definition of what the hypothesis in the conjecture was. And so by this theorem, you then get the corresponding statement. On. to mention one application that goes in the other direction. Um, so as I said, historically, this was the one of the earliest constructions or desired constructions of prismatic homology. But now that we know how to construct this side purely using algebra, we have other tools for computing the right-hand side that don't refer back to this theorem. So we have purely algebraic approaches to understanding the right-hand side. And then you can use this theorem to translate it to new calculations. So it's not a lot of 
And I just wanted to mention one of them. Um, so this theorem plus the algebraic We'll review stuff, and next time I'll try to get a little bit more into what the exact objects are. Okay, thank you. Yes. Everything I'm talking about in the stock is in the periodically complete setting. So for rings, I could just say periodically complete. In the variety setting, I would have to say something like periodic formal scheme. And I just didn't want to do that. But everything I said sort of works in that setting. 